to the Public Voice Salon. My name is John Braden. We are a progressive dialogue on culture, politics, and the critical issues of our time. And tonight we have the pleasure of broadcasting from the Institute of Classical Art and Architecture on 44th Street in Manhattan in this most amazing, beautiful room where we just heard a lecture by Sabin Howard, who was a sculptor who focuses on classical sculpture. Um, and tonight, he gave this amazing uh, statement, a lecture, on the importance of classical art in the modern age. It's a kind of a rejection of postmodernism, um, of abstract art, and getting back to the basics, getting back to beauty, and what is beauty. And we heard from some wonderful panelists here, from art critics and art lovers. There's definitely a shift going on in our society now, and a reappraisal and a reappreciation of classical art, uh, going back to Michelangelo and uh, the what they call the Apollonian vision of art uh, versus the Dionysian. Uh, Nietzsche wrote an essay about this where he talked about the Apollonian, which is the classical, which is the age of reason, versus the Dionysian, which is more uh, kind of a uh, chaotic type of art, let's say, which would be represented by modernism or postmodernism. So we're going to walk around the room. We're going to try to get some people to speak. Maybe we'll get Sabin himself if we're lucky. Um, and uh, But this is just an amazing room, and I just feel so nurtured and nourished by by the spirit of art and the beauty of, of the room that we're in. Have you shown some of the pieces, Claudia? Let's see if we get some reactions from the people here in New York City, which is one of the great art capitals of the world. People really appreciate and know about their art. And we're going to see uh, what we could learn tonight. Tell us who you are. My name is Bernadine Vendito. OK. And Bernadine, what did you think about tonight's event? What I thought about tonight's event, that it was an opportunity to appreciate the beauty of art okay. and simplicity. Yes. Wonderful. Do you, have you seen Sabin's work before? Um, I work? had just recently become familiar with it. Okay. I have not seen it other than um, through his website. Okay, that's fabulous. Wow, wow. To me, I think, again, this is like, this is a wonderful nurturing uh, type of experience where you could learn something about art, share it with people on television, and... Uh, I think it's an ongoing thing. Art is something you can never know enough about, you know. And uh, so thank you for sharing tonight. Thank you. I feel, for me, it's, it's simply the beauty of it. Yes. And the uplifting was what okay. really left an impression on me. So you don't go for the postmodern art? You don't go for the abstract? Um, or? I just think it's simply what, what are you looking at? What do you appreciate? And it's the beauty of that. It's very simple to me. That's wonderful. Wonderful. OK. So thank you for being on our show. We're here with Sarah, who's an actress which is a wonderful art form in itself, acting and theater. And tell us what you thought about tonight's event. Well, I thought it was really wonderful. I thought all of the um, arguments, I guess if you would call them, were very well-rounded and okay. very interesting, thought-provoking for what is going on in art today and what is lacking and, and um, what we as a society could use some more of and how this art is one small part of the answer to that. Sabin Howard tonight issued a major manifesto about a new kind of art, about a re-appreciation of classical art. And what do you think about that? Are you a fan of modern art at all? Or modern art? Um, a little bit, but okay. but, okay. <laughs> but, okay, okay. but even but even right. that, I am also skeptical. I do believe the emperor has no clothes. That okay. it is okay to not right. like things that right. are popular in right. the media okay. and. Okay. And I do think that there should be a return to um, discernment, as Tracy had put it. I think that that's a really important thing to forming an educated opinion as opposed to just going with the flow and taking another person's opinion on as your own. And did you study theater someplace or acting? Or? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was a theater major at NYU many years ago now. Okay. So. Tell us about your acting very quickly. Oh, um, well, most of my... Uh, most of my experiences on stage in straight theater and musical theater. I'm also an aerialist, so oh. I do that too. How exciting. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you for being on our show. Thank you so much for having okay. me. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So here we are with the man himself, Sabine Howard, on this historical moment when a new manifesto has been released tonight about the re-appreciation of classical art and the role of classical art in our society today after going through the postmodern era. And uh, 
Sabin, tell us a little bit about tonight and what it's meant to you. Um, well, thank you, yes. John, very much. Uh, I can be very succinct about this. Yes. I moved these sculptures in tonight, uh, actually this morning, five hours between 8 and 12. It took us, we set this show up, and Kevin, who was one of the movers, said, this is what a man could do. It really shows what a man can do. And I think that's the best way to put it. You look at it and you know it's art. It's not pretentious and it's understood by everybody. And that's very important. It, there's no manifesto that's necessary. It adds to it. But the meat and potatoes of it is that it's something that is for everybody and because it's, we're human beings and so that's why. There was a lot of talk about Marcel Duchamp tonight. He's oh, kind of like, urinal. he's it's the bad boy. Down the toilet. He's the bad boy. And flushing postmodernism down that, the toilet. That. And I wanted to say as an educator, because I feel like I learned a lot tonight about, about the importance of art, about beauty in art, and uh, it was certainly very touching how your wife introduced you and how the two of you collaborated on this wonderful book together. And I want to get later into that. I want to talk to Tracy. And to hear from all the panelists and to hear from you, and to be uplifted and educated in, in this. Thank you. And I think about our school systems today, because I've taught in New York City Public High Schools, and I see how they're not educating anymore. Yeah. And there's no more humanities, and everybody's a business major now, and when you major in business, you don't learn anything, you don't get any kind of aesthetic upliftment or education, and I see what you're doing as an antidote Thank you. to that. It really is, uh, Sabin. I appreciate and, uh, that. So this has been wonderful. This is a beautiful room that we're in. This is the Institute of Arts and Architecture. Well, proportionally, so, do you notice how yes. the figures fit very well in the environment? If you look at the columns and the okay. spacing of all these parts, yes. they're all based on human proportions. Yes. So the sculpture becomes a focal point for the whole room and oh, the setting. Oh. And, and, and that's what you used to have. Yes. Now you've had this kind of separation between architecture and art. And that was oh. one of the reasons that I came back to this place, because it's oh. called the Institute of Architecture and Art. Yes. It's uh, contemporarily, it's called feng shui, and okay. the whole concept is that you have uh, elevation of spirit and you feel good in the space. Mm. That's mm. a given, you mm. need that. So yes. the next step also is to put the sculpture in places that are very conducive to elevating your spirit. I feel like we're living in an age of alienation now. Yeah, People are so disconnected. Exactly. And the human is getting left out. You yeah. Know? Everybody's on these online communities where yeah. it becomes fragmented, right? Yeah. The age of fragmentation. And to see a human well, three dimensional. Being. It has substance and yes. it's not on a page, it's not on a flat screen. Yes. You actually have to walk yes. around, it occupies space, it has yes. energy yes. unto itself. Yes. I gotta so, ask you though. Yeah. Do you get teased a lot by some of the postmodernists? Do you have any friends that no. are postmodernists? How, no, do you, I, how do you relate to I don't to have I don't okay. pay attention to the art world. <laughs> okay, I actually okay. just Yes. I'm I, I'm very actively right. producing. And I'm very interested in like making things, right. and I'm not really so interested in all this philosophy anymore. Okay. But I do think that I need to speak a little bit because a lot of people pay attention to my work, okay. and that's really the bottom line. Right, right. Now, do you go to Chelsea? You don't go to Chelsea. No, I don't. I, don't che I go to Chelsea, Chelsea for dinner. That's okay, it. Okay, okay, okay. I would. I don't go to art galleries. Ah. Um, yes. And really, it, I'm not interested in what's going on in the art world. Right. Could I say something maybe controversial at this yeah, point? Yeah, go ahead. What if Why go wouldn't you? down the road? Okay, <laughs> I'm just saying, just just to be devil's advocate here. What if we could get beyond the either or thing and just say that both are wonderful? And it's your work, like besides God. an abstract work, would would be a dialectic of some kind. Or Here's yeah. the thing. Okay, yes. Um, I think there's a place for modernism. Okay. Because it's not visual art per se. It's philosophy about us and uh. that's fine but when that aspect of it that it's art rules out traditional art and pushes that out of the way wow. then I start to take offense so wow. then I but I've come to the point that I don't push back okay. it's just I do what is necessary to move to where we want to go wow. I'm not getting into some polemic yes. Yes. or some political discussion. You're a pioneer and you're going back. I just want to do going, it and not. Yes, yes. And the fact that you were 19 years old when you started, when you became an artist, that gives hope to a lot of people. I see young people today when I taught in college who were 19 who have no hope for their lives. Wow. They're just going to work in some dead end job that they don't like just to make a living or whatever and they have no conception of art. This is a man who became born Thank at 19 you. when he went into a museum. Young people, if you're watching, 
this to me is very redemptive. Very direction much. element of this. Well, it's, of it's, this you of you, this you can have a dream, okay, yes. but then here's the actual yes. other aspect that's not talked about. Yes. You need to do the work, yes. and it takes a, a yes. structured work where it's built upon a framework and it yes. continues. It's yes. not just wow. work that's like random. Wow. So that's the difference. Thank you for nurturing all of us you, tonight. John. And I want to talk to Tracy now because I want okay. to get her thoughts don't on this. Don't miss everybody too. else. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Dean Howard's lovely and talented wife, Tracy Slatton, who co-wrote a book with Sabine and who has been kind of a muse and an uh, inspiration for Sabine and sort of a coach as well. What I, what I love about the two of you is like as a creative couple, it doesn't get better than this. The two of you, as, as you're a writer, he's an artist. Tell, tell us a little bit about that, about how, as a couple, you inspire each other. Well, um, yes. we had a lovely evening tonight, yes. and okay, yes. as a couple, well, Sabin says we wrote the book because he got up one morning and he was obsessing about art and the state of art and yes. how he makes art and how important classicism is, how no one knows that. Yes. And I said to him, well, we just have to write a book and tell everyone. So I don't remember that conversation. So we began this collaboration to write the book, The Art of Life, oh. and we would sit and talk. And there were times this discussion got spirited and uh -huh. things might have been thrown and names might have been called, you know. But we, we kept working at it and we got this process of getting clear with each other about what he meant, how he worked, and kind of thinking about why classical art, modern classical art, realist art, why it's important to people. And it was really, it was really fun. And it was interesting to get inside my husband's head in a different way. You know, not just saying, oh, please pick up your dirty socks, but saying, oh, so why is the palm uplifted? Why is the sternum uplifted? So. Tracy, the name of our show is The Public Voice Salon. We're a progressive dialogue on culture, politics, and the critical issues of our time. And I loved it when you started tonight, because you gave it both barrels as far as politics. And you, 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 you basically, you know, you called the shots, you know, about the Republicans and how anti-art and even the Democrats and how both parties have become so, you know, uh, divorced from, you know, the human needs. I think that's really what I'm thinking right now. I'm thinking out loud, and I see the humanity of Sabin's work, and I see how this society is being run down by plutocrats, right? This is why we have Occupy Wall Street. This is why we have some, we need democracy, okay? That this is the Renaissance. And tell me a little bit about your politics and how your art and and tonight's the meaning of tonight. Look at the room that we're in. This is a very important evening. This is about the resurrection of classical art. Yes. And what is the political meaning of that in terms of this race for president that's going on now? Well, you are asking such great questions. Yeah, you, you know, you. the meaning of this art is about lifting up to be the best person you can be. And I feel that the Republicans and the Democrats, they just both have it wrong. That it's um, the de Democrats have become a party of the lowest common denominator of handing down instead of doing what um, what John Kennedy said: ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. You know, the Democrats are becoming a party of a social welfare state and handing down to people instead of helping people create opportunities where they can rise up. And the Republicans are only interested in tax loopholes, and they're missing the boat altogether. So this is about human spirit and show, show the art. what show, we can show, do show that sculpture this is about rising up rising this is up, yes. being yeah. the best person you can yeah. do giving to the world giving to the community yeah. Sabin spoke at length right. tonight about giving to the community yeah. and this is really an art that reaches out to everyone Apollo honey because Apollo is reaching up yeah. now this is a very important point and as a teacher and I've taught in public schools and I've taught at the college level and they're really not educating anymore in this country. They're training people. They're training people for low-end jobs. Business major is not education. They're, they're leaving out the humanities. They're leaving out philosophy. They're leaving out history. And what I see you and your husband doing is the opposite of that. It's an antidote to that. But do you think, though, to be a little controversial, because I do like modern art. I'm going to say that right now. I, I, I kind of like both. I love the classical and I love the modern. And I, is there any way for the two of them to coexist in your mind? Yes, okay. I think, and I think what will be interesting is seeing how they, it's like thesis, antithesis, synthesis. Okay. What will be interesting is the next 20 years, as modern art stops being only about uh, alienation and dissolution, and the classical art 
takes on some of the vibrance of modern art and some of the boundarylessness of modern art. So I think we're actually at the at the we're on the edge of this great leap. We're at the precipice of something wonderful happening in the art world, and this is part of it. I love the fact that you know Elton John has taken a liking to your husband's work because I happen when I think of Elton John and I think of the music that he's created. Who else has given us our soul? You know, and uh, songs like uh, like your song. You know, when you think of the the tenderness and the humanity of this kind of work. And I think about the fact that the next work that Sabin wants to do is sculptures interacting with each other. And you and I are having a dialogue now. We are. We're trying to bring dialogue back. That's right. This is a very dialogic space, as you can see, yeah. people watching at home. People are you not know. islands. We, we no. work together. Where yes. People are in communication always. So uh, I'm excited for his next sculpture that will yeah. show people relating. And do you see this kind of thing on CNN? Do you see this kind of thing on TV? What we're no, doing right now. No, you no. We don't see it on Fox. No, right? no, we don't see No, we, we don't need see any of this on Fox. This is about the human spirit. And yeah. the human spirit doesn't just happen in isolation right. or as a standing classical figure. Right. The human spirit happens between people talking, sharing ideas. You saying, I like modern art, me saying, yeah. okay, that's cool. You know, here we are. Wow. We're 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 engendering something wonderful and we're creating something wow. wonderful, a rebirth of the human spirit. And of course the conversation will go on. Yes. So thank you so much, Tracy, for being on our show Thank today. you. It was fun. Okay. We are here now with the Vice Consulate of the Italian Republic, Mr. Steve Acunto, and he was on tonight's panel, this historic moment of a reaffirmation of classical art here in New York City right. at the Institute of Art and Architecture for Sabine Howard. And tell us a little bit about tonight's uh, event uh, and what it meant to you, Steve. Well, it was an exposition uh, more than a an art show. It was an exposition of values. Uh, tonight, well, let me step back a moment. The Italian Academy Foundation, which uh, I have the privilege of chairing, uh, dedicates itself to classicism in art, mm. to sustaining the best traditions of the West, mm. many of those which were developed and create or created in Italy. Yeah. So tonight was an affirmation of those values and, an, and a presentation of classical art. Mm. This is what. Well, Steve, I want to tell you, my great-grandfather was born in Naples. Oh, good. And, uh, you know, when I think about the Renaissance and I think about all that greatness and all that art coming out of the Dark Ages, you know, and now I look at around in our society, I look at our educational system and I look at the politics. I mean, what is happening in our world today? Do you think, we're, could we be moving into a new Dark Age in some way? Do we need a new Renaissance? Well, what we have is uh, we have such a mix of belief systems that there's okay. ambiguity. And frankly, we have replacing a classical tradition in art, yes. random experimentation, yes. the exigency of the media, the mm. speed of production beyond the content mm. approval. Mm. It's almost as if you could imagine you can produce a book relatively yes. instantly yes. that speaks nothing about its content. Wow. There's no relationship between the creation and the content. Mm. The best of what's past is no longer trusted by the mm. modern. Thank you so much. And you know, when you think Thank of Italy, you. when you think of Dante, you think of Fellini, yeah, you think, think of some wonderful traditions. All the good things. Italy is yes, uh, yes, yes. is magical. Sophia Loren, of uh, course. Uh, speaking, uh, of, speaking of magic. <laughs> yes, indeed. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Okay. Thank you. So we are here at the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen. That's the name of the building that we're in here. Um, and it's on 44th Street in, in Manhattan. And we're looking at some of uh, Sabin Howard's amazing sculpture pieces here and trying to keep classical tradition alive um, in an age of postmodern art, in an age of excess uh, randomness perhaps, uh, trying to uh, keep that human spirit going. I just think this has been tremendous and I've learned a lot and uh, but realize there's so much more to learn about art. Of course John Dewey says that the aesthetic is the opposite of the anesthetic. The anesthetic puts you to sleep. And so much of our society today, I think, is putting us to sleep. So much of the media, so much of the politics, it's boredom, it's repetition. Uh, here you got the real deal. This is, uh, it doesn't get any realer than this. Uh, although, like I said, I do also appreciate modern art. It, I think it has a place. I think both are okay. But I think we've lost the classical tradition over the past, you know, maybe 50 years or so. And this represents a resurrection of, of those values and so
Thank you so much for watching this segment of our show. Claudia is going to talk a little bit about um, the novel A Hundred Years of Solitude by Gabriel Garcia Marquez, which she just reread. Um, this is a very important novel for Claudia. Uh, coming from Colombia, and um, so let's just start before um, open question of what what is it, Claudia? This is the second time you read the book. Yes. Okay. Um, what what did you get out of it this time? What what stands out to you in terms of you know what what details are most important uh, to you from this particular reading? Well, for this reading was like more. A little more details than the first time. Mm -hmm. The first time I read the book, 100 Years of Solitude, or mm -hmm. 100 Años de Soledad, yeah. I was in high school. So, mm. you know, in high school, normally we do the homework because we have to, but we don't really analyze every single detail. Mm. This time I read the book again one month ago, maybe, mm. because my niece, Laura, mm. uh, she's now in the university, and she has to make an assignment mm analyzing the writing of the book. Mm. So we have this conversation about the book. And for me, it was very interesting because I was able to understand a little bit more what Gabriel mm -hmm. Garcia Marquez mm -hmm. wanted to show us. Mm. Also, for me, it was interesting to finish the book because the first mm. time I didn't finish it. <laughs> okay, okay. Now, you're not alone in that. I got to <laughs> tell you this because this is a book that is complicated. Let's be real. Um, and, and some people, including myself, I have to confess, two years ago I started to read the book and I gave up about halfway through, but motivated by you, I'm going to go back and give it another try. Um, there are plots and there are subplots and there are characters and you have to sort of follow all the different names. And, and um, I, you know, I, I happen to love many aspects of the book, but I think... Um, I just got a little confused, and I'm going to go back. What 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 is it about it that's confusing uh, f for you, or is it not confusing for you? The no, it's not confusing. It's um, okay. what I say was in high school. Normally, we do just the assignment, mm. and it were different little groups in the in the classroom, mm. and was one particular group that they have to finish the book. So my group was actually the beginning and the middle of the book. So the other group was the middle and the end. Mm. So that's why I didn't finish the book. Mm. And I understand it's a little complicated. He used a lot of metaphors. Colombian people like to tell uh, stories. Mm. And one of the ways to tell uh, stories is using metaphors mm. and all these literary figures for writing. So maybe that's why it's the complication there. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And because the region, Colombia has different dialects. Mm. so. Uh, the capital has a special dialect, okay. the coast has a different dialect, mm -hmm. but even uh, Argentina, I have a friend from Argentina and she told me that she couldn't understand the book, even mm -hmm. was Spanish. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but the thing is because he used this uh, writing to the future, to the, ba to the past, uh -huh. so he's moving forward in the, in the different, different tense of time. Mm. And, and that's why maybe people get confused. Who, what are you talking about? And then you're talking about another <laughs> thing. What is going on here? Ah. But I think it's fascinating because it's the way that he captured people mm. that really are reading the book. Ah. People have to be close to the reading, otherwise they get lost. I guess if you're too scientific or if you have the kind of person who doesn't like ambiguity or it, everything has to be spelled out for you in black and white, this probably is not the novel for you. <laughs> Or maybe it should be the novel for you if you want to learn how to think more meta metaphorically and, and to be kind of open to that sense of magic also that he brings. Um, Gabriel Garcia Marquez has uh, pioneered a style known as magical realism in which he mixes reality with the fantastical. Um, so why don't we go to the text and why don't we get something, um, a piece that you could share with us and, uh, okay. and see what we think. Okay. But this is the beginning of the book, say. Okay. Many years later, as he faced the firing squad, Conor Aureliano Wendia was to remember that distant afternoon when his father took him to discover ice. At that time, Macondo was a village of 20 adult houses built on the bank of a river of clear water that ran along a bed of polished stones, which were wide and enormous, like prehistoric eggs. Mm. It's interesting because... 
he started describing the book actually from almost the end of the novel. <laughs> so that's he started moving forward on the times. And also because Macondo is imaginary place, it doesn't really exist. Uh, but he described too many characters from a town from the north coast of Colombia. Mm. So that's why it's very interesting to follow the book. And, and when I just heard that, you know, what stuck out to me was, you know, the time his father took him to see ice, you know, how beautiful that is, you know, the memories. And it makes us think about our own family backgrounds and those moments that were special and meaningful that a relative took the time or a parent to show you something very cool, you know, very interesting. And the fact that it's by a river, you know, here we are in Hoboken, New Jersey. We're right by the Hudson River. You know, and I grew up in a town on the Hudson River, Edgewater, which was up the river a ways. And um, could I share a picture of you, of my hometown? Of your hometown? Yes, while we're in this conversation. Maybe you could point the camera to that painting right there on the wall, which my dad made um, of my hometown. My own dad um, on the Hudson River. And as you can see, it's a small town, um, which through the painting, kind of has a magical feel to it. Um, and I just wanted to show that as we continue our conversation. And here's a painting that I found on the street of Van, by Van Gogh. It's not an original, because I'd be rich if it was. Uh, it's a representative of a painting that he did um, of a small town in um, a southern part of France where he was very fond of. So let's go back to our kind of little bit of a sort of a digression to uh, explain uh, small towns and the meaning of a small town in my life and uh, in this Van Gogh painting, uh, and to connect M Macundo also to any kind of a town, small town experience that you may have had growing up in, uh, in Chia. Well, uh, Chia is a small town north of Bogota. And talking about north of Bogotá, that reminds me that García Márquez finished his high school in the Liceo Nacional of Zipaquirá, mm. which is like uh, one hour from Chia. So it's very close to, to my town. And it's interesting because he was in, in the North Coast, and then he has to move to finish the high school in, in, the, in the center of the country. Mm. So... Small towns, I think, everywhere and <laughs> are very cozy, at least in my country. Mm. They're like the community, yes. it's very important. Yeah. I don't see much about community here in the United States, or at least the places I have been, but community is important. And one of the aspects of our show that we're trying to create is to expand the sense of community. Um, and I think examples in literature can really be useful, you know, any example th using all the arts, but in particular literature, the details of a small town, of a, of a sense of community, of people who know each other. Of, I remember when I read this book, this, the details that come back to me now is that people actually went to visit each other, you know, which is kind of unheard of today unless you have a schedule, an appointment, and it's not during the 70-hour work day that people are overworked and disconnected and alienated and so there is something about that sense of community I think that that really did um, was very powerful for me when I read when I read this book uh, and uh, so Claudia is there another excerpt you'd like to uh, read yes now that you talk about work uh, okay. he described something that was about in the banana corporation in this book mm. which is also related with the history of the country okay uh, Probably is not exactly like, mm -hmm. but it's, it, it has uh, some things that is, are well real. So he say, ladies and gentlemen, the captain say in a low voice that boss is slow and a little tired. You have five minutes to withdraw. The redoubled hunting and shooting drowning out the bogle called the announce the start of the count. No one move. Five minutes have passed. The captain say in the same tone, one more minute and we'll open fire. Jose Arcadio II, sweet in eyes, lowered the child and gave him to the woman. Those bastards may just shoot, she murmured. Jose Arcadio II did not have time to speak because at the instant he recognized the hoarse voice of the Colonel Gavilan echoing the words of the woman with a, with a shoot. Uh, this is important because in that moment he's describing in this book mm. 
was the the employees from the bananas were uh, asking for the rice. They didn't receive the payment. Uh, the owner of the bananas was a, a guy from America. <laughs> yeah. And they were taking advantage of the people over there here in this book. And what happened, they get affiliated with the police in that moment, and they start shooting people, and it was a big massacre. Mm. So I want to read the last, the other okay. part would say, when Jose Arcadio Segundo came to, he was lying face up in the darkness. He realized that he was riding on the endless and silent train and that his head was caked with dry blood and that all his bones ached. He felt an intolerable desire to sleep, prepared to sleep for many hours, safe from the terror and the horror. He made himself comfortable on the side that painted him less and only then he discovered that he was lying against the people. There was no free space in the car except for an isolate in the middle. Several hours must have passed since the massacre because the corpses had the same temperatures as plaster in autumn and the same consistent of pretty fried foam uh, that it had. And those who had put them in the car had had time to peel them uh, in the same way in which they transported bushes of bananas. Trying to flee from the nightmare, Jose Arcadio II dragged himself from one car to another in the direction in which the train was heading, and in the flashes of light that broke through the wooden slats as they went through sleeping towns, he saw the, s the man corpse, women's corpses, child corpses, who would be thrown into the sea like rejected bananas. So this is very powerful. It's the metaphor of uh, human beings who were killed by this by this dictator, by this oppressive government, being compared to uh, old uh, bananas being dumped into the ocean. And I think it's a very apt metaphor, considering the United Fruit Company and all of the havoc that was wreaked upon South America because of the corporate control of politics in the United States and corporations dictating government policy. And you could say it goes all the way back to the Spanish-American War in 1898 when we invaded Cuba, when we invaded uh, the Philippines um, based on a false flag. <coughs> you know, the main, the battleship Maine was not attacked, okay? So what is important in this book is how Gabriel Garcia Marquez used the reality. And I remember my father was talking, he was in the Civil War in Colombia, mm. and he was telling us how was the war in that time. Mm. And when he, I was reading the book, came to my mind all my parents' uh, words he was telling us. And I think it's not only in Colombia, I think it's in all the countries that mm. uh, we're supposed to have a democracy, but the democracy is not really the one, it's the one has money, the, ha the one mm. has power. But anyway, I really enjoyed the book because yeah. I learned a lot this time. Uh -huh, okay. <laughs> I share with my niece. Oh. All the conversation was yeah. very beautiful. Um, for me, Garcia Marquez, besides I learning in high school, okay. I have a brother, he likes to read and write. Mm -hmm. And he used to read this book. He has all his books. <gasps> so oh, that's Gabriel your brother, the teacher, right? Right, he's okay. a teacher. Yeah. So it's fascinating when you have a brother that reads everything <laughs> and then uh, when you find these wonderful treasures yeah. in your hands and you start wow. understanding what's going on wow. it's very enriching for your yeah. life and this is another reason i know we don't want to go too into politics but i believe we should have a 25-hour work week <laughs> in this country another reason why is so we'll have more time to read because i don't have enough time to read all the books that i want to read including uh Marquez's Hundred Years Garcia of Solitude. Marquez. Garcia Marquez, I'm sorry, my darling. <laughs> and this way, once I read it, then we could have conversations about it. Okay. On the air or off the air? <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> thank so, you. Thank you.
So here we are in Hoboken on the waterfront. Um, and one of the things we're going to try to do more of, Claudia and I were having a conversation about this, that we've been featuring a lot of New York and we've been neglecting our own hometown of Hoboken, um, which is a very beautiful place. Uh, Hudson County uh, has its own wonderful beauty and we want to highlight this more and we want to show the particularities that are on this side of the Hudson uh, not only the beauty but also the people and we want to try to get some conversations going with people very randomly you know just walking around and encountering people and and objects and buildings and different things on this side of the river and we also you know we, we're very aware of this kind of uh, New York snobbery you know where people in New York think that you know, it's all about them, it's all about New York, and there's a kind of an ego-centricness to that that I think needs to be ameliorated. And something I just remembered today, actually, is the fact that most major cities throughout history were begun on the left bank of a river. As you come in from the ocean, what's ever on the left side, that's historically has been the place where the great city has evolved. So maybe that place over there <laughs> was a mistake. <laughs> Maybe this is the real uh, historically significant cultural place that will emerge and evolve uh, down the generations. And But I, even as I say that, I realize that that's ridiculous. I love New York. Um, it's indispensable for certain cultural things. Claudia and I were at the film forum. You know, we always go to see theater and film and cinema. And, but I think New York has become a colder place over the past 10 years. And I believe Bloomberg had a lot to do with it, you know, and the whole financialization process that's been going on over there. It's like, it's become all about arrogance and finance. And so places like Hoboken are really very cozy and human. And I think for America to relearn how to be a citizen and how, how to interact with your neighbor and to be humble and to be kind. I think places like Hoboken, which are near a big city like New York, could be a great incubator for this type of growth, this kind of intellectual, cultural, and social growth that we're trying to promote. And one more thing, uh, I started a project called the Evolved Urbanite, which is really bringing together culture, community, and urban life. It's a way to uh, enhance the quality of urban life. Most people who move to the city, you know, a big impetus is because they want to uh, they want to be stimulated socially and culturally. They want to live some kind of bohemian life. And what's happening nowadays is that people are becoming more isolated. Uh, they're working jobs that they don't like. So they're not having any sense of meaning from their work and they're being overworked if they have a job. Those who don't have jobs, there's a lot of people who don't have jobs too. But um, and there's very little culture. We see the media has become very barren, very banal. You see t television like, you know, Jersey Shore and this kind of thing. And it's becoming a very denuded cultural landscape, whether it's on the media, whether it's in the school systems. The school systems have been they've been taking out the humanities and focusing on a business major kind of uh, marketing dynamic, you know. So what we're going to do in this show, what we're trying to do is to create a better society, to bring human values back, um, to promote aesthetic education and art and, and basic humanity, just people you know, learning how to talk to a stranger, talk to your neighbor, you know, reconnecting, creating a sense of interconnection and intersubjectivity. Uh, and I think a town like Hoboken is a great laboratory for this type of experiment. So welcome and we're going to walk around Hoboken now and discover its beauty and talk to some people. So here we are in Pier A Park, and I just met Abhishek sitting on a bench, and he's going to tell us a little bit about himself and a little bit about this beautiful day. Hi, uh, my name is Abhishek. Uh, 
Well, uh, it's a beautiful day. I live in Hoboken, and you know, I thought to like come out, and and such a nice day. A lot of people enjoying the day with you know a lot of activities. So, uh, well, I, I work in the city, okay, in Midtown. Um, I I'm from India. Um, I did my master's in computer science from Syracuse University Upstate, and I've been working in the city um, as a software engineer and live in Hoboken. It's, it's a nice neighborhood. I really love living in Hoboken. Uh, it has, you know, very rich culture, like very diverse culture. People from all around the world live here and, and they enjoy in, in, in the parks and, you know, beautiful. I mean, wonderful. Abhishek, has any other television show ever approached you to be on and just talk about yourself in the day? No, I have, you're the first one who approached oh, me and it's, and it's, a, <laughs> it's a very nice uh, you know, <laughs> okay, opportunity okay. to tell something about myself and wow. you know I mean I appreciate you yes. uh, talking to me. I feel there's a lot of alienation in our society. A lot of people are sort of cut off from each other. So we're trying to make it a more friendly society just by doing this you know and you were very friendly, you were very open. We appreciate that and you've actually been one of the nicest people we've spoken to. Well, uh, you know? I appreciate it. <laughs> and it's really nice talking to you guys. I, I agree with you, like in, in um, you know, today's world, like people spend most of the time with a lot of electronic gadgets and, and web and also, me, I, I work in web, I'm a, I'm a technologist, but yeah, I take yeah. some time to like go outdoor and you know, just uh, enjoy the weather, talking to nice people like you guys. Nice. So it's always a good break. Yes. Maybe it's a matter of balance, you know. I mean, obviously, we do need the technology, right? We're yeah. not going to completely go and do away with all of it, but maybe because of that, we need to find ourselves back in a human situation. Absolutely. In, in real conversation and also experiencing culture and reading novels and in watching films and sure. seeing works of art and, and coming together and talking about that and also thinking about politics. You know, if, if, if citizens stop talking to each other, then the democracy is not going to be very very healthy. Absolutely. I mean, I couldn't agree more. Uh, technology serves a lot of purpose and actually like technology is being used to uh, bring people together and yes. connect them. But nothing could take place of, yes. you know, physically meeting someone and talking about the views, about different wow. things like, you know, politics and, and weather, and, you know, all these things. Like you can do that online with a lot of different technology gadgets and all, but I think like nothing could mm. take place of meeting people and, you know, yes. discussing about different things. So. Well, you know, for someone who's never been on television, you're doing pretty good. Oh, well, thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I may, think I was waiting for this break. <laughs> may, may, maybe you're ready for the big time in New York. Maybe, you know, <laughs> CNN, maybe when they find out about this. Well, I, want him on. I would be glad <laughs> if something like that opportunity come to my place. So, yeah. Uh, if we had more voices of the humble citizen on the air today, instead of just all the same talking heads, you know, blah, 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 mm -hmm. with the corporate agenda, I think we would have a better country. We would have a healthier country. Tell us a little bit about India, for those who haven't been to India. I mean, I've seen pictures. I haven't been there myself, but I understand it's a very spiritual place. And it's, it's very spiritual, and I don't know, like, how many people know, but yoga is... It, the origination of yoga is India. Um, it's been there for thousands of years. Unfortunately, not a lot of Indians practice that. Oh boy. <laughs> and it's it's a very good uh, thing that, you know, since I came to America, I saw a lot of people practicing yoga. Wow. It's one of the oldest, uh, you know, way of meditation and being healthy yes. um, back in India. It's, it's pretty awesome. In, India is one of the developing countries. Um, I think like from political sense, uh, the relationship between America and India has been uh, very strong and currently we are one of the very close partners in various different um, you know uh, areas like technology and health and you know education uh, America and India are coming closer and there is no doubt that these two countries are the future of the world and you know when you we say that also I always like to remind people that uh, we have to also keep in mind uh, to care about people and average citizens and not just have a corporate agenda that benefits uh, a tiny elite. And what I'm saying is I'm being critical of the outsourcing that goes on. And, and I think that uh, thinking about the spiritual life of India and, and Buddhism, there's a lot of Buddhist, Buddhist ideas there. Um, I'm reading a book by Jack Kornfield, and he talks about loving kindness and uh, this idea of an engaged Buddhism where there's a spiritual Buddhism where you do engage the political.
political realm as well. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, having more time for these kind of interactions would be better if we had sure. a shorter work week, you know. Uh, yeah. you, what's your work week? Uh, I well the the work week is normal like you know from nine to seven or eight in the night. Uh, yeah, I mean, I usually take my time in the weekend to to relax and you know enjoy sunny days in in this kind of beautiful park in Hoboken. Yeah. What would you think about a 25-hour work week? Oh, <laughs> 25 hour work week is, is a dream. Uh, I hope that yes, will yes. that will we're, come. We're through. advocating that. We're telling everybody that, and to, we're trying to build a political party that will advocate for a 25 hour work week, and that would also advocate for peace and caring and sustainability, and create a spiritual politics based on love and caring to create a world in which these kind of interactions are more common, mm -hmm. and that overcomes the alienation. What do you think about that? I mean, I couldn't agree more. I mean, <laughs> 25 hour work week is a, is a dream. Although we have to think about the competitive nature of all the uh, industries in, in, in America, um, you know, I think uh, less hours is always good, but you know, America has to be competitive in a lot of things in, in, the, in the world. And it takes a lot of efforts and a lot of hard work from you know, every employee in the, com in the company. To, to achieve that. Have you read Karl Marx? Uh, no. <laughs> Maybe you should. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll give it a try. So anyway, uh, thank you again for being well, on our show. Thanks a lot. Thank okay. you. Take care. Okay. So here we are on Court Street. This is actually one of my favorite streets in Hoboken. It's so beautiful to look at. It's a cobblestone street, and you feel like you've gone back in time when you walk down Court Street. I believe you can see a part of it in, in the movie On the Waterfront, um, which was shot here in Hoboken. Another thing that gives Hoboken a kind of a cinematic mystique, the fact that it's very rich in, in, in cinematic history, uh, being that On the Waterfront was filmed here. This is a very romantic street, and uh, speaking of romance. I think about my lovely wife Claudia who's filming me right now and without her, without her love and support and kindness and caring, uh, this show would not be possible. So I tell Claudia, thank you. Okay, we're on the corner of 6th and Bloomfield Street and this is the home where Stephen Foster used to live, the great American songwriter, and I'll read the plaque that's here. It says, Stephen Collins Foster, composer of Old Folks at Home and Other Immortal Songs, lived in this house during the year 1854. It was while living here that Jeannie with the Light Brown Hair was published on June 5th, 1854. This is the only house standing today in which Stephen Foster is known to have lived. And I believe he also wrote O oh, Susanna, Camp Town Races, and uh, it's kind of like the Elton John of his time. As we look at the beauty of Bloomfield Street in Hoboken, gorgeous brownstones, uh, pastel colors, very rich in architecture, history, and beauty. And we wrap the camera around now on the corner of 6th and Bloomfield Street. Just capturing the beauty that is in Hoboken. Okay. Strolling along on Bloomfield Street, we encountered a citizen uh, who was friendly enough to want to be on our show, and she's going to tell us who she is. My name's Nicola. Hi, Nicola. Um, and you're washing the windows. Is this some kind of a spring cleaning like ritual? Yes, it is, actually. I haven't been out for weeks, you know, outside, so it's a beautiful day today. So I thought, well, I'll come out, water the plants, done a, little, a lot of yard work today, so it's been fantastic. That's wonderful. Can we watch you in action, washing yes, those windows? This is, Let's. Okay. This is a very quick way to clean the windows instead of actually having to okay. get up on a ladder and everything. So. Do your thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Quick and easy. 
Easy. Okay. Now, look how beautiful that looks with the water dripping down there. It's just so gorgeous. Your home is so gorgeous, I want to say. I mean, the aesthetic beauty of it. And tell us where you're from. You have a beautiful accent. I'm from Scotland originally. Oh, that's wonderful. Yes, yes. Yeah, and I've lived in this town about 18 years. Our goal with the show, we're trying to make Hoboken a friendlier place, but I think it is a friendly place already, but we're trying to, you know, do what we can to bring people together and create a space where, you know, that's less alienating and people know. What's your take on Hoboken, like, versus New York as far as a community? Well, the thing is, I don't really know what it's like to live in Manhattan. You know, I mean, I worked in Manhattan for 10 years, yeah, yeah. but um, as far as, you know, neighbors here they're fantastic on this block a lot of people have lived here for many generations and I mean I know that this house dates from about 1890 and I think that I'm only about the third or fourth owner in that time so you know a lot of people have lived on the block for over 50 years and um, I find Hoboken to be an amazing place it's just um, you know especially around 9-11 as well everybody came together because a lot of people uh, lost loved ones or about 50 lost in this town which is a lot for a town this size but um, I I love Hoboken I love Manhattan but okay. as I say I can't really comment on Manhattan because I've never lived there yes, yes, so yes. Wow. well you make Hoboken a friendlier place just by being open to this kind of a thing of like being on a TV show is this the first time that you've been approached to be on a television show I actually did something very small one day and it was um, uh -huh. they were from Japan and I don't know yes. they asked me to say something in Japanese and I don't even know what it was so I, I, <laughs> oh that's as far as it goes wow. um, you're, you're a natural I think you're ready for the big time oh, I think you're ready you. for that <laughs> well, thank you so much for being on our show oh, thank you enjoy the beautiful day thank you okay take thank care you. front here of uh, all Saints Church on 7th and Washington Street um, and as you can see there's a flyer for the Optimist daughter which is a novel by Eudora Welty I've never read this book and uh, I have actually never read Eudora Welty either but um, just walking by and seeing that there's gonna be a book club discussion here for for this book it gets me curious about this particular writer and makes me think about her other works because I see um, there's other books coming up, uh, Intruder in the Dust by William Faulkner, The Heart is a Lonely Hunter by Carson McCullers, and Brighton Rock by Graham Greene. Um, I love the fact that this book club has been around for about 10 years, and they have it every, it starts like in September, and it goes through June. Every month there's a different writer, and it's open to the public, and they have coffee and cake, and you can come and discuss the book. Some of the memorable books that I've been, I remember, for discussions have been On the Road by Jack Kerouac, and um, Portnoy's Complaint by Philip Roth. Those are two of my favorite writers. But it's a great, place for the community to uh, interact with other people and uh, talk about literature and uh, learn something about the work of w literature by having a conversation about it. So it's social and it's cultural at the same time. And that's a wonderful thing about Hoboken that uh, there are these kind of things. And as you can see, we're in a very vital public space here on Washington Street, people walking around us and there's lots of room to interact and engage with a stranger and uh, talk to an acquaintance. Um, there's a book by Robert Putnam called Bowling Alone, The Collapse and Revival of American Community, where he talks about the mental health of a community is best defined not by how many friends you have, but how many people you can have a brief chat with on the sidewalk. And so you can see in Hoboken there is that potentiality to have conversations with people. Of course, one of the problems in our era is that people are very overworked. Um, I think if we had a shorter work week, I think if we had um, people had more time, and I think if we had also more kind of venues like this book club and other type of you know cultural gatherings where people could come together and discuss things and meet meet each other and meet meet their neighbors and encounter a stranger, I think we would have a much better society, a more caring society, but at least we have sort of an infrastructure here in Hoboken for this type of activity. Um, so we're going to try with our TV show to grow this and expand on this, and uh, we're very happy that you're watching us, and we'd like you to be a part of this. Uh, you know, send me an email and, and come on the show and say what you have to say. And we invite strangers to come on our show if you like to. This is a public voice salon. It's a public public show where we're breaking down that sort of 
kind of a hierarchy between the media and the people, right? This is, we want people to feel that, you know, that they're empowered, that they have intelligence, they have a sense of agency to even to name the problems in our, in our, in our society, the political problems in a, in a society in which both major parties are controlled by corporations at this point. I think we definitely need a, a third party. Let me just say that right out there right now. I think, uh, you know, either, no, I don't even know if the Democrats can be reformed at this point because uh, I think it might be too late. Hopefully it's not, but if not, we should definitely support the Greens or create, create something brand new. This could be the start of a third party right here. I hereby declare a third party is born in Hoboken, New Jersey, when people are going to gather together and find their agency and find their critical intelligence through conversation with each other. Um, and the miracle that's born here is going to go out around the world, just like Frank Sinatra started in Hoboken. The voice, he was the voice. We are the public voice, the public voice salon. And this beautiful mile square city, so charming, so quaint, so peaceful, and uh, just right across the river from New York City, so we can go anytime we want. If there's a theater or we want to see a film or anything like that, New York is right across the river, but we can retreat back to this cozy oasis, this humane oasis of the beauty of Hoboken. Thank you for watching the Public Voice Salon, and we invite you to be on our show and, and uh, let us know what you think about it and let us know your thoughts and how we could make it better. Have a wonderful night. Till next time.